Um, so, first of all, um, thanks very much for uh, letting me stand up here and talk about Docker. Um, I don't think you know what you've left yourselves in for, but you will in about half an hour. So, the first thing I'm going to kind of say, just to make clear, this is my experience, this is about my experience getting up and running with a tool called Kubernetes. Just to get a rough idea, can I have a brief show of hands who's heard of Kubernetes? Okay. Uh, anybody else used it? No? Okay. Cool. Um, so I can pretty much get away with quite a lot of things that I wouldn't <laughs> otherwise. Great. Um, <laughs> I take no responsibility for anything that you may do after this, uh, on my advice. So, <clears throat> there are two questions. First question, I started writing this talk and thought, right, okay, how I did Laravel and Kubernetes, and I thought, actually, that's, that's a bit of a stupid question, really, because um, Laravel works, why am I trying to muck things up? Other than um, perverse sense of masculinity. And I'll explain a bit about that. Um, to begin with, I'll explain a bit about what, uh, what Kubernetes is, what this whole concept is, what the whole Docker thing is about. So, the idea with Docker is that by putting essentially each process in its own something like a VM, you get the encapsulation um, that you can get some security benefits, but it's not a proper VM in that you do have um, you don't have the full security of uh, of a VM in that sense. But <clears throat> that's the details of uh, of how the encapsulation works and so forth are but I'm quite technical to be honest. Talk. Nice thing with Docker, in a more practical sense, is that it gives you a way to have the same environment for your Nginx or your PHP or your Apache that um, you will in production. And that's in dev, that's in testing, that's forever. Gives you some more control over that. Not perfect, but much, much better than you might otherwise. And I have been able to lift and lay uh, Docker containers between, for example, AWS <coughs> or my local machine and have them do exactly what I expect, which is nothing short of a miracle. So, to start off with, the, the way I'm spreading this no is the symbol of Docker. Uh, for reasons I'll come to later, uh, the owl is Kubernetes. Um, also, it turns out that you can work out how to draw an oil, so that had to go in there. And uh, the balloons were from something else from ages ago. But altogether, the point is that you have a tool that lifts wheels into clouds. Hey. You! Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, now, the obvious problem of sticking something in a cloud is that unless there's some reason for it to stay there, it'll fall out. I just wanted to use this clip. I'm going to skip through a wee bit. Just out of curiosity, anyone, any idea where this clip's from? The Tiger's Eye. Yay! Source of genius. Over and again. Yes. I'm going to skip through a wee bit because the reality is not all of it's that friendly. Right and what you'll. Uh... Okay, probably not that far. Into <laughs> another slide or whatever. Okay. Well, you get the difference. The key point of this is that you have a wheel that suddenly spontaneously appears in the middle of cloud. And the thing with wheels appearing spontaneously in the middle of cloud is they're not very well supported. Um, particular thing I like about this context is that the wheel in this, uh, in this clip is suddenly discovering the world, trying to name everything around it, and going in a process of discovering what, the, what its environment is. So, I don't know if anybody heard that in the back, but essentially that's about the point that the whale works up that it might uh, want to make friends with the ground or the boat of petunias. Now, the big difference between a whale and a boat of petunias is the boat of petunias knows what's going on, and you watch Hitchhiker's Guide to the Cubs, that makes more sense. Um, I'm going to claim that, and I don't want anyone at the back to contradict me. Um, but the point, of, the point of that analogy is that to put something in the cloud using Docker, Docker has these you know, great features. But you need to have some way of keeping it up there, some way of sustaining that. And also some way of it not being some isolated blob that's no idea what's going on, but it's actually linking to things around it. Points for the segue? Awesome thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I've covered a couple of points of the why containers there. Um, 
I think it is something that is a bit um, of a buzzword and it's a bit hip at the moment. But there are actually some concrete benefits when you start using them. And I found Kubernetes brings those out a bit more. So <clears throat> this is kind of, I, I started looking at container stuff. I started looking at you know, blogs online and thought I could actually, this was pretty much me, which are Docker containers over my shoulder, which can be launched in clouds. However, when you actually sit down and start playing around with Docker, this idea of effectively uh, encapsulating things away from having to worry too much about individual context turns into something more like this, where you, every time you get to another machine, you end up setting up Docker in a different way, setting up different components, trying to put it all together. So, dealing with Docker in practice can be a pain. Um, it's very interesting, it's got some really nice science behind it. Um, just a very brief aside, on Tuesday, there is a containerization sort of cross meetup thing. So if anybody is interested in more of the detail about how the containers go together, I know there's somebody doing a talk on that. A few different things along those lines. Okay, so trying to actually get containers to play together and to link up and to, uh, service discovery, all those sort of things, is then the next level that you have to suddenly deal with. And a tool called Docker Compose makes that a lot more uh, straightforward. <clears throat> you create a single YAML file, kind of, sort of paraphrased a bit there, but ultimately you can say, I want Nginx, and it is some image that might be the public Nginx image, or it might be uh, one that you have got in a private repository that's actually uh, nicely tied together with an app. And you can pull in Postgres quite simply, uh, you can say what you want, you can provide um, files to indicate what you, what environment variables you want available, and that's, you can effectively get Postgres to create the database for you on startup if it's not already there, and so forth. So actually with this one YAML file, you can get a nice Laravella up and running reasonably quickly. And the implementation step is Docker Compose up. Put a couple of flags with that, but ultimately that will bring up Nginx, so in my case Nginx, PHP, FPM, as separate containers. You might want to do uh, them together or Apache. And uh, Postgres, um, um, maybe you then have to think about well, actually, what happens if I want to run Artisan um, at some point? Or, uh, maybe I have to do something to the database that's uh, linked into the app that isn't one of these things. So there's a couple of questions around it, but ultimately it's a nice quick way of getting an app up. Okay, so that's all great, that's fantastic. And what can you do with that? You can go onto GitHub and suddenly you have a wealth of things that are only one command to set up, uh, including these things. Um, GitLab, uh, I guess most of you have come across GitLab at some point. Has anyone tried to set up GitLab on a server? Don't, really just don't. <laughs> and <laughs> suddenly I understand their upselling model is just run it on gitlab.com. Um, however, with Docker Compose, one command and it's running, so that's another way of looking at it. Mattermost is um, a plain rip off of Slack, but it's similarly one command, yet you've got this reasonably complex inter uh, interaction of services. Tendai is quite a cool thing uh, coming out of Dublin, actually. It's an uh, event, uh, open source event management framework um, built on Laravel, so that's quite fun. And then Nextcloud, um, they're doing things with Collaborate so you can have document editing. All these things, Docker Compose will bring them up in a command, which is pretty cool. Um, However, this is kind of what's going on. Um, <clears throat> I'm not saying this in a bad way, because that doesn't look great, I'll be honest with you. But the concept that's going on with Docker Compose is that you have this nice one command, nice one command, and behind you all of the complex stuff is happening. That's part of the point of the encapsulation, is that you don't need to worry too much about what's going on if you're just firing it up on your local host to see what happens. But that has limitations. So <clears throat> just to kind of recap where we've got to so far, 
I have started using containers because I want to have a system that I can bring up and it works exactly the way it did when it left the shop. <clears throat> it's something that I'm not wondering whether certain dependencies have you know, failed to download or whether there's been a configuration issue or etc. But that's all included in the definition. Docker Compose gives you a lot of that, but you then get into some questions about how do you deal with scalability? Maybe different, uh, you know, different processes need to um, be scaled up and down differently to others. Uh, you also have a question of, so doing, logging into your server and doing Docker Compose up. Well then, I've had some problems trying to get Docker Compose installed on the server, and then it's got an API version mismatch with Docker running on the server and so forth, and then you kind of think, wait a second, this sounds awfully familiar, <laughs> but just replace the word PHP with Docker. Um, so having something that actually maintains the detail of what you're doing is much more useful. So here's your YAML file, that's great, but it's not all that you want. So discovery, so Docker Compose um, is quite, that's quite cool. It, it will um, inject, uh, I think it will actually update the Etsy host file, if I remember right. Um, to reflect some of the other things that are available in your YAML file, so, P so Nginx can find your PHP FPM. It definitely it will put in environment variables to uh, tell you where what ports are available in the different services. And it does that all for you out of think about. But if you're doing anything more complicated than your five things in the YAML file, um, suddenly that becomes a more complicated problem. And also trying to move things uh, up to a uh, server somewhere else, uh, maybe from dev to staging, etc. How do you actually get it there effectively? <coughs> um, so that's some of the issues obviously with talk about those. And this is a t-shirt that I really want. Um, and you get back to this point, which is how do you manage to get this all up in the cloud or, uh, or even on the VPS remotely, whatever you want. How do you do that? So, Kubernetes. <clears throat> Kubernetes is a thing from Google, um, which hopefully will survive longer than Google Wave, um, or I <laughs> really have wasted a lot of time. The idea with this is that they, they've kind of gone a wee bit, arguably, off the other kind of end of the scale. Kubernetes gives you a lot of control. And suddenly you feel like you've got AWS running on your computer. Um, that's not the kind of thing that sounds like a good thing. But okay, fair enough. Um, it's not that bad. It's not as bad as it works. It's not as bad as everyone says it is. And I really hope you believe me. Um, has anyone come across Mesos? So, uh, that's another one in the same sort of space. And Docker now have their own Docker Swarm, which is supposed to be a good bit easier than Kubernetes. Apparently, it's quite fast. Uh, bringing instances up, but not as flexible. So why do I like Kubernetes? Um, everything's a thing. So no longer do I have one YAML file where <clears throat> I just put everything in and hope that it sort of makes sense. I have a concept of services that I expect, you know, I expect Nginx service to be available, and that might be one or more Nginx actual processes that are handling. And I kid you not, it's, this is it's a holy grail. You can actually run the same thing on different providers. And <clears throat> don't get me wrong, there are, you still have to think about what resources are available, what's provisioned there, but it becomes less of a concern for your uh, concern for your development infrastructure. So you can. So I have, I've defined my app uh, in my. YAML files and Kubernetes, and I have done this, tried it, have fired them up to my, well, on my local machine, oh, okay, that works, then changed the target to AWS, oh, that works. I mean, who says that? Um, especially when you're having to deal with that AWS interface, and that's a great thing, suddenly you don't have to. Um, you can define the kind of things you wanted to start, the kind of, the, effectively, VMs it's running, Another nice feature. If I have uh, kube control is the 
a tool that runs on the command line and allows you to effectively uh, interact with <coughs> uh, the Kubernetes cluster, wherever it is, cluster so called, that you're running on your machine, that you're running on AWS, and it's not that you're having to go anywhere to run this or change anything about what you're doing, you just tell it, okay, now I want to work on this cluster. What's available? Same commands. Once you've told it you're working in a different cluster, all your commands are the same. All your commands for setting up your service, for taking down a service, for setting up a uh, container, a container, all the same. And all local. Okay. Um, there's quite a nice tool, I'll get back to in a minute, called <coughs> Spread. Uh, lets you uh, version your config much more effectively and it allows you to deploy straight from your Git repository with your infrastructure in it and it will set up your cluster and so forth. I'm not going to talk too much on that because well, you'll find out shortly. And this becomes a question of, gives you some separation between uh, your, let's say physical machines, but your VMs and what you've provisioned and uh, what you're actually running in terms of processes and where they're lying. So for example, you might have two VMs but as far as Kubernetes, when you look at your Kubernetes cluster, you've got six processes. And you can find out where they're running, but it's not your first question. They're running on one of those two machines. Okay. So by this point, you've probably gathered that a lot of stuff's gone on and that you start to get a bit confused. I certainly did. Uh, the other thing is you probably realize that I'm overselling this completely. Most of those things are mostly true. <laughs> Okay, that's the caveat editor. If you've already gone and tried to set up your Kubernetes cluster, that's a waste of time, I do apologize. However, <clears throat> everything's the same, that's, that's not too bad. Uh, no changes, you, you obviously do still need to know what you're setting up. So, for example, I followed a, a nice little tutorial about setting up Kubernetes in AWS, and then I looked at my email and I got a high charge alarm four days into the month <laughs> that said, oh, by the way, those three, just in case anyone's uh, familiar with the Kubernetes price scaling, uh, M2 medium servers it automatically fired up, which would cost me maybe, I think each of them was $60 a month. Um, so, <clears throat> and I think three was the starting point. <laughs> so, yeah, so you need to tweak those kind of things. Config scalable version, well, I have had limited experience with spread so far, but possibly. I believe it when I really see it. And again, same as the previous one, you do actually have to think about what's going on under the hood. You just don't have to look at it. Uh, okay. However, the last one's absolutely true. I've never found the YAML file for Alcacelsa. No. <coughs> a complicated diagram to make me look as if I know what I'm talking about. The What I'm trying to do here is draw out a few of the key concepts. So when you go and say, okay, what's this whole Kubernetes thing about? that there is something that actually relates it back to the PHP context. So up here, we've got somebody running this kube control uh, command. Maybe you're asking for a list of services, maybe you're talking about what's being deployed where, uh, maybe you just want to know if the cluster is up and running or what, um, what's died, what's need to be brought back up. That contacts Kubernetes servers. So this is one thing that's already different from Docker Composure. Doc Kubernetes is running a set of services. <clears throat> it's providing virtual network, which you do get with Compose, but it's also providing um, some DNS um, and uh, other features. But that means it needs to know what's going on. And it's live, so uh, quite those things, all Kubernetes processes are stateless. They are backed by an etcd. Um, configuration store. So it's got an idea of what's going on. You tell it what you want to do and uh, then you can have a look at it in the dashboard. And I kid you not, despite this tool being all of these command line bits and pieces that you can do from Google Control, it does actually have a built-in web interface. So you can fire up a dashboard, I'll show you that in a minute, and that gives you uh, an overview of the key things that you have running in your cluster. That's on your local host, that's on AWS, that's on 
Google, uh, Google Container Engine, wherever it is. So <clears throat> those key concepts, a deployment, essentially your template for what your container is going to look like. To all intents and purposes, it's just your container definition. Your bit of YAML file that says, I want Nginx, and I want it to have these volumes, and these environment variables. Then you will also say maybe how many of them you want. Sake of argument, we'll say one. That brings up a pod, and a pod is an actual concrete instance. Technically, a pod might be two containers that are very tightly, uh, very tightly linked, but in practice, normally it's one container, so roughly equivalent conception. And so, <clears throat> to illustrate that a bit more, say I've got Nginx defined, I fire up a container and it's called Nginx plus some sort of uh, unique string um, that I've apparently copied and pasted three times. Imagine those are different. PHP, FBM, same deal, and in this case I've chosen Maria, um, because I didn't see the CVE that came out this afternoon. Not sure if that actually affects Maria, but if anyone, if anyone hasn't seen that, check out my SQL um, CVE that came out. Okay, <clears throat> that's all fine. That's all concrete stuff happening up there. We've also got this concept of services that says, if somebody's looking for PHP FPM, find the thing called PHP FPM on um, port 9000. So that's already something that we don't have in Docker Compose. We've got services, we've got uh, this concept of deployments and calls. Now, what does that actually look like when we move into reality? Because Kubernetes, we're talking about a lot of abstraction here. Um, useful abstraction, and um, I think it's within reason, but what are we actually looking at on, on say, two nodes, two VMs, whatever? Well, okay, so we've got a container that maybe is just MariaDB, effectively running in its own encapsulated process. PHP, FBM, same, Nginx, the same. And <clears throat> those we can check which machine they're on, but we don't really care too much, um, at least at the basic level, as far as I'm aware. And that's really all this is all doing. It's just making sure those processes are available. Um, side point is, if they die, um, if you set it up kind of the default way, it will bring them back up for you. Okay, one thing to point out is I'm a web developer, um, not a designer, and that means I have the right to use Comic Sans in presentations. Um, so, <clears throat> in this case, I'm kind of just to give an example. Say you've got an incoming request, it reaches uh, Nginx through whatever way it does. Nginx will say, okay, I, you know, this is something that I need to talk to PHP FPM about. And then Kubernetes can say, oh, you're looking for PHP FPM. Tell you what, I know where that goes, and it will um, give you something back from the DNS. That means Nginx is able to actually hit PHP FPM. But the nice thing about all this is, again, you don't care where it physically is. Um, Kubernetes is just handling the back. So all you know, you wanted one PHP FBM, you wanted one Nginx, you wanted them to talk to each other. Magic happens. Okay. This is not a joke. <coughs> this does exist. Um, it's actually quite good as well. Um, I watched it and I thought, I like the giraffe. Um, <laughs> it's the kind of thing that once you've got a rough idea of what's going on, it's more helpful, I think. But <coughs> This is an eight minute video that someone, someone started off by doing this as a, effectively as a blog post, a series of instructional bits tying together to explain how Kubernetes uh, works. And uh, it's told through the medium of this giraffe which finds itself floating in the middle of the ocean um, and gets picked up by an owl who represents the ship Kubernetes um, for reference because Google are um, generally quite geeky people. Kubernetes actually means helmsman in Greek, and it's where the words gubernatorial and something else come from. Um, so, <clears throat> definitely check that out, just for the sheer comedy value. Okay, so how did I get here? 
Um, there were a few requirements to this project. Uh, and I'd also like to just give a shout out to Janine who I was working with in this is uh, uh, Clears Digital. Um, they were uh, really quite, uh, really great to work with. And <coughs> we you know, had a discussion that we could see what it's going to be a need to move between five providers, which we did. Um, it was also a requirement that for the developers that there would be something which is important, uh, something that Heroku might. Like. That it wasn't going to be you know, ballooning in cost. So something, this is one of the things, Kubernetes apparently is quite popular for uh, a lot of the newer startups in, um, in the valley of the shadow of Kubernetes. And also that you're not using a system that ends up having to have somebody on hand all the time to you know, fix your broken build server. Okay, right, okay, so I'm gonna look around the options. So, um, do you know how much effort it is to get blinking text in HTML these days? <laughs> just, just to put that out there, I don't know how web designers survive. But, <clears throat> the key point with this is that GitLab has this cool thing called GitLab CI, I'm gonna put that mouse, it's actually quite urgent. Um, they have a thing called GitLab CI. It's a very cool concept that you can fire something up to GitLab and it will uh, look, see if you've got like other build systems, see if you've got a GitLab CI.yaml file in your repo, top level your repo. If it's there, it says, okay, I'll give this a crap, and then tries to build it on their servers for free. That's, like, that's actually active by default now on GitLab.com uh, repos. So, okay, so they've got the CI. That will give, you know, that at least means you've got a managed CI system already. And, it's so, okay. It's gonna be some way working around this one. They, they said, well, we can actually deploy, we can build your containers. We're already using Compose at this point to get up some sort of uh, example. And so, well, we can deploy containers uh, to Kubernetes. Not to Docker Swarm, not to anything else, but Kubernetes. So, okay, right. Okay, I'll try and start and get my Docker Compose stuff, work it out, get it into Kubernetes. I said, okay, well, Google Compute Engine, um, that will uh, provide someone to turn it up. So I got that all set up, got Google set up. And uh, started, I just playing around, got containers the way I needed them. And I <clears throat> uh, got to this tool, Spread. This is the one, it's a system for versioning and for deploying to Kubernetes. And it gives you a nice to take your Git repo and it manages it um, with all your Kubernetes stuff and you can just basically point it out what cluster you want to work with. Um, so all your infrastructures in GitHub or GitLab or wherever. Fantastic. And GitLab had uh, written their stuff to work in with this. So you could, um, you could <coughs> do a one-step deploy. Then, you know, as a last step, your your uh, continuous integration. Okay, so then I have to work out how to get get this all together. See if this is working. Find that this was the case. Um, unfortunately, they haven't actually updated to the most recent version of the API yet, which means that all of the stuff I built up doesn't work with Red yet. So my Red experience is consequently quite limited. Um, once they get to that point, GitLab CI will be suddenly much more useful for them. But if you use the older API, it's fine. New API is more complicated. But definitely check out GitLab CI, even if you're not at all interested in Kubernetes, do check that out. Okay, so this is a little bit like the experience. Kind of thought, I've got it, going for the win. Finally worked out how this goes together, and come. There we go. Take that. However, um, you can answer that whatever way you want, uh, but I still actually found out a lot about Kubernetes that I really liked, and I also realized I got a bit of the hard way. So, <clears throat> turns out, actually, you can still use GitLab CI, because so that's actually just a useful thing. Um, another tool, um, if you're thinking of going home and playing with this, 
is check out Tiny Cube because it is actually what you want. And I was going around going, but it means a VM and containers. Well, that's just complicated. Ultimately, just out of curiosity, is anybody else here using a Linux as a first machine? Okay, so for the benefit of the video, there was at least 30 people behind. Um, however, <laughs> if you're using Mac, you're firing up a VM anyway, right? So, um, for doing anything with containers. So, it's not actually any additional work, and it gives you a magic Kubernetes just works. And then you can play around to your heart's content. Okay, so it fires up VirtualBox. You do need VirtualBox to build. And you get something like this, this actual screenshot. Um, <clears throat> this is what I was talking about, a dashboard. Here's some of the pods running. Now, at the moment, I'm showing the Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes stuff that it's running internally, effectively. But you have a very similar layout for your actual um, app. And you can click a button here, and it shows you all of the stood out output from the, those processes. So I can click here, and if there's been any errors, throw them to the command line by PHP FPM. I get them in a nice web 2.0 Ajax to the max uh, interface. Okay. So, so far you haven't actually had to do anything there. Then you say, okay, well now I need to actually create something. Nginx, okay. Create a pod, as I said, that's basically, it says containers, but often what you want is one container in your pod, so. <clears throat> it's not quite a one-to-one -one correlation, but for most, for all of the ones I used for the Laravel side of things, it was. And this basically says, well, it's going to have a port 443. It's got some image. Maybe that's uh, something with your app inside it, and then it's. Um, and it's a, couple, I think it's a boilerplate, but that's pretty much it. Then you've got a service. <clears throat> and that essentially means that Kubernetes knows, oh, when someone says Nginx, they probably mean to find some pod like this or one of the pods like this, and to root it appropriately. So, <clears throat> that, so this is telling Kubernetes that there is an Nginx that does something in 443, and this is saying what it is. To some greater or lesser extent. Hopefully any Kubernetes experts won't have got that far through the video, uh, so hopefully get away with that. But that's, that is essentially, I think, what's going on. The, okay, <clears throat> modular me now. The slightly more accurate version is that we define a deployment. And all the deployment is is just a template for these pods. Because maybe we want, well, for example, I create a pod. A pod is just, it's basically a container, or containers. If it dies, then the pod's gone. So what we really want is a template that we say, well, actually, we always want one pod, or two pods, and this is what they should look like. And that's a nice feature that when you're running Kubernetes, by default you create these things and it dies, bang, it's back up. So if you kill a pod, another one comes up and takes <coughs> place. And the service is just what I showed you. So, okay. Now, <coughs> elephant in the... Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to move on to the slide now. Um, <coughs> so, the, uh, <laughs> why I actually ended up doing the whole Docker thing in the first place was I came across uh, Dylan Linger, and I think I remember you doing <coughs> at some point on the Doug Art PHP Alphas channel, I think. Uh, Dylan Linger, yeah. This interesting number of posts and different things, but he'd done one on Docker and Fig. Fig's the old name for Docker Compose, so uh, it's about, I think that article's about two years old. Still quite interesting, it's how I got up and running, but I found there were a couple of things I need to tweak. Um, for a small fee, I'll tell you what they were. Um, there were a few things that you have to think about. This is one, I've actually had a chat to Paddy Curry about this as well, I'm not entirely sure what better around doing this. Um, PHP, FPM, and Nginx need to be able to see your app, um, or at least parts of it. And if you have your app in the container, that therefore means you need to build two separate containers with your app in them which means having your code in two places, which I'm not massively fan of. But 
Uh, that's not, in a practical sense, that's not, that works perfectly well. Um, so during my GitLab CI build step, I build PHP FPM container with the app, Nginx container with the app, and then I deploy them to React, um, which is still somewhere I'm looking for. Okay, uh, secrets. That's, I'm not going to kind of go into detail on that because um, the pops will close by the time I finish. Um, and <laughs> so you could probably do with somebody who is an expert in Kubernetes to talk about that in more detail. Volumes, again, you kind of need to think about where, uh, what's being saved where, where it's been backed up. Um, if you are using a node in AWS, there is a slight point that actually uh, you are able to mount things from a container, from a distributed file system, if you're really feeling fancy about cluster uh, FS or something like that, it will work in with Kubernetes and you can do that. Um, artisan poser and related migrations. So those kind of things you also need to think about as well. I happen for um, the project I've been doing, we needed a couple, we needed artisan subscribing, we also needed an artisan control. So I have an artisan container along with those two as well. That again has to have access to the code. And <clears throat> you can run that um, and you can kind of use that to run Composer. So I so during the build step, that means that GitLab has access to Composer and Artisan um, because those containers are right. Okay, so just to kind of sum up, because I know that's gone quite a broad uh, overview of what's going on, these are the kind of containers I'm using. Um, one that's actually tweaked a bit for Laravel, uh, but it's basically Nginx. One that's for PHP FPM, a bit tweaked. The MariaDB one's not really that tweaked, but um, it looks kind of cooler if you put Dr. Laravel and stuff. Uh, Artisan, <coughs> again, it's similar tweaks to these where it just is a little bit more aware of Laravel things like, um, for example, making sure the storage directory uh, has the right permissions, uh, things like that, when it's building up this thing. Basically, it pulls in your Git repo, builds it up, uh, whichever, pulls it from the release when it's building, and then it makes sure that the right things have the right permissions, and stores it all up in this nice image that can then be replicated all the time. So that's, that's your build step, basically, in this context, is get the repo, join it with one of these, each of these, and then fire it off to some sort of private repository. Um, <clears throat> and then Redis, because I was just getting a second writing Docker Laravel. Uh, now, say pro tips, but as I said, this is a learning experience, so am tips. Um, <laughs> I've seen a couple of people tweeting about this, um, that I'm not the only person who's got burnt by doing um, there's a really actually quite a cool thing called Kubernetes the hard way. And I've now spoken to two people in Belfast who have done this and gone, it's doing what with my AWS account? Because all you're doing is free stuff, right? Except you just turn on to have started up 12 instances. Um, <clears throat> Google Compute Engine has Kubernetes built in because it's, you know, their thing. But, um, <laughs> I literally when I tried to slide, I was like, I wonder if that's still wrong for so there's three hundred dollars of resources if you haven't used it, should have. Um, and many you can use your machine, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's going to involve some interesting internet reading if you want that to actually be useful. Okay, uh, one other one that I did get <coughs> was talking to somebody who was uh, much more experienced than me. Said, uh, said to you know, if you were starting Kubernetes again and you wish you knew one thing or you know as many things as I can fit into the slide. What would you what would you say? Is it um, well actually going straight from rather than going to Docker Compose and then trying to rewrite that into Kubernetes? I said just get your head around Kubernetes and then start using it. So there's an argument there that if you're not using Docker Compose, you don't have to do kind of a, a staged thing. Um, okay, demo. I'll maybe uh, leave this for the moment, and uh, if you want to do your talk first, I'll leave it. Rather than, I don't know how we're like, what we're like for time. We're okay. Um, pizza's view of Any time in the next 15 minutes? I don't know. I'll do my after pizza. Nearly got it. Would you need time to? Um, no, provided that my network works. 
<laughs> okay. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, right, so just to prove how easy Kubernetes is, I'm going to mark up that one. Um, that's fun. Hey, there we go. Okay. So, so far all I've done, uh, just to save a bit of time, because my laptop uh, moves at glacial speeds uh, when it's starting up, in case you don't notice that. I started Minikube, that will have fired up the VM, just to prove that I'm not lying to you. And also to make sure that this doesn't fail at the first step, I shall launch VirtualBox. That doesn't look like VirtualBox. That is on this screen. There we go. Um, let's see. Somewhere. Okay. I could actually just not full screen that. There you go. So, it's a wheel, and this is an actual VM, many cubes will have downloaded that when you installed it, and it's fired up. Okay. So there's a real thing here, it's not magic happening. Um, <coughs> can we get out of virtual box VMs? Okay. Oh, okay, so, that's fine. Now, Always good to try and find a file path while you're in the middle of talk. Okay. So what I've done here is created a little app. I'm not going to go too much into the uh, GitLab CI things. I might. That's probably something that'd be kind of nice as a filler talk itself. Um, but you'll see this is uh, Laravel. This is 5.2. Excuse me, being a bit behind the times here with this one, but. Uh, it's got GitLab CI YAML file. Uh, in that YAML file, uh, I use Vim because I'm a hipster. Um, I've got a series of variables to find that basically say, I think this is a slide of use of GitLab CI, so you know, if you're from GitLab, um, please. Um, <coughs> And what we do here is say we want, uh, we put a URL that's available from the environment. And then we want to build, uh, so the build ref name is, it's some hash that doesn't, not really too significant right here, but actually no, I think it's the master if possible. Um, yeah, that'll be the get rev. So that gives a build image and then a release image so that we know that once we've got build and test done, then we can update the release image. So, but as I said, we need to have our code appearing in three places, which is one of the things that I don't really like, but I still haven't found a good solution for. Uh, otherwise. <clears throat> okay, so we've got four steps here. Um, and this all runs on GitLab servers. You will find that it's quite slow. The whole thing takes about 20 minutes to run through. However, I, you can run, uh, you can set up what's called a GitLab runner, you basically give it a machine somewhere and you run GitLab CI runner as a uh, script and you can hook it up to your GitLab so that it runs it on some beefy machine rather than on their weedy free server. <clears throat> anyway, so what I'm doing here is uh, it will run this actually in your uh, in a checked out version of your repo. So I say oh, da, 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 da. composer install. That's a very verbose version of that. Um, I then build these three things. As I said, I've, in the repo I've added uh, Docker files explaining, I'll show you those in a sec. Um, can then run tests, which is running PHP unit. Uh, inside that, and then I do a whole load of Docker commands that just make me wish you could loop in YAML files. Um, but <clears throat> essentially, here I am uh, telling it that I, okay, now the test is passed. This build image is now the release image. 
Um, you notice they only master, so it means that you can use other branches without automatically triggering the entire CI chain. That train. Um, and you can do that per step. So maybe you want to do the test, build a test. Maybe you don't want to do a deploy. Um, okay, so deploy. <coughs> should have only announced from side. It uh, has to do something kind of bizarre. So the way I'm doing this at the moment, as I mentioned, uh, spread doesn't have, uh, hasn't got to the stage um, of doing Kubernetes deploy for the most recent API version. Basically, that when I show the, the YAML for Kubernetes, is not quite the same. And so for the moment, in the interim, I'm pushing to a private repository, um, which I can then call from any Kubernetes instance that has access to it. And that's in AWS. So there's a, li a little bit of a pain point trying to get um, AWS to let GitLab push to its repo. That's not entirely surprising, uh, but unfortunately, you do, well, which is probably not a bad thing, but you do need to regenerate uh, the access key each time. So these are things that you put in your GitLab repo um, for a specially created user um, that has authority to basically push to your ECR uh, container cluster. And then you can do that. So, if anyone's got a better suggestion than that, I'm very interested to hear, but that does seem to um, keep everything fairly tight. Oops. Now, okay, so that's <clears throat> the other thing you'll notice in there that's non standard from Narvel 5.2 is not that, is that. I've got a definition of those. Now, this might join a couple of things up. Um, so I've got, these are still works in progress. These are public containers, Black Teal, Docker Laravel, Artisan, PHP Nginx. Uh, they're very heavily based on Dylan Lindgren's ones, which you can also use. Uh, but I've tweaked these a wee bit so they'll work better for Kubernetes. Um, you can see what's happening here is basically that the app is being inserted into that. Uh, you start with the general public container, you put the app into it, and it knows when you package those two together into this image that you're going to push to your private repository. Uh, it knows that's where to find it. Okay, so that's, um, go back to that the questions if there's anything on that. Um, okay, basically I'm now putting off the fact that I have to show this working. Um, <clears throat> so earlier, I pushed this to GitHub's um, push that repo to GitLab and uh, build everything, um, I believe. Uh, here is GitLab. Um, it's not quite GitHub, but sure. Um, go to pipelines. And this is it having run each of those steps. And just to prove it does run those steps. Whoops, ladies. I'll go into that. Uh, let's try build. That, incidentally, that is a repo. I took that from a clean Laravel uh, project. So there's nothing else in there. Um, okay, so I can click that and I can actually see what happened in the runner as it ran each of those commands. And then you can see it um, putting the stuff down. Uh, you can also see it took eight minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. So the Kubernetes side of this end, so well, that that's that's one thing. Kubernetes. Uh, now I've got a whole lot of YAML files. So if I do that, you'll see um, I've got. Um, <laughs> Do, do apologize for any HTTPS purists that I have used the snake oil certificates in this in this demo. Um, <clears throat> I'm serving on local host, it's okay. So I do have to have a load balancer, which is a little bit weird. There are ways around that, but it, it makes that a bit easier. I mentioned I've got those three services, and I've got deployments defining what containers should look like. I've also got a selection of secrets here. Um, Again, that, that's something I'd be interested in your thoughts on, but um, 
Kubernetes will let me, for example, uh, take a oops, take a um, base64 string. So basically, take uh, the ticket certificate base64 and code it, and then I can define this in some way that I can let certain containers have access to it. Um, and that's actually not too hard to implement. You'll see in a second that it will reference that secret <coughs> and in the containers definition. Um, I also have <laughs> classic security minded approach. Base64 does still mean what they um, It's local logs, it's local logs. And that means I can make those accessible to certain containers that need them, like, for example, the DB, but also. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, services, start with that one. Nginx, that really isn't actually that much more complicated than I showed. Um, the key point yeah, is that we've got it actually referred to as Nginx. Um, but it can select it, so that's a selector service. I think I might have missed something there, but anyway, it seems to work okay, so let me double check that. Um, I also create some disks. <coughs> uh, it's basically for storing log files and so forth. And this is got a path in the host, and it will map those into any containers that I've told you have access to them. And I've used that once a week there. Um, I can put a capacity, I can get access mode and so forth. And there's a lot more settings that I'm showing um, available because this is supposed to provide, this is supposed to provide orchestration. So I was talking earlier, to, an analogy I kind of use, maybe a bit unfair, but for a Docker Compose, if you've got a feel of what Docker Compose is yet, Docker Compose to me feels more like a script that brings in a whole lot of VMs that you run because you want these five VMs available, copy your script, run your script. Whereas Kubernetes is something more like popular chef, that it actually orchestrates what's going on <coughs> um, and can respond in certain ways. Okay, so the projects. Uh, so Nginx, Taishua, yeah. Okay. So here <coughs> I've actually got the image. Um, there'll be a nicer way than embedding a full name, but for the moment, this is the private repo that I'm using. Um, <laughs> I don't, you know, that, that does require credits to get to, uh, but it's at the moment got a uh, blank Laravel install, so it's hardly that exciting. And I also say, okay, this, this container, this Nginx container, has to have port 443. It should have that Nginx participant storage I just showed you. And it should have that SSL secrets, and that appears as a file, and that, or as a directory with those certificates. It's kind of a nice feature. Um, up, looking up at the top, I uh, do have to tell it um, how to get from the, this private repository. Uh, if anyone's doing this, butts their head against that, do chat to me. We're not going to go into the mechanics of that now. Um, I do tell it what kind of service it fits into, and um, I tell it. Uh, let's see. I, uh, this is still all a template. So the deployment knows that it can turn this section into a container when it needs to. So one dies, it goes back and says, hmm, This is what we do. Bing! Of the container. Or pod, in the sense of terminology here. Right. Okay. For that. So, please be running. Yes, okay. So at the moment, there's nothing really exciting there. Um, just basically telling me that Kubernetes exists, there's no pods, there's nothing happening, it's not very exciting. I can check this lovely little mini cube dashboard that there's nothing going on. Okay? 
You've seen in the box, there's no rat. Now, I've got a little script here, which is, you know, ignore the bottom comment there. Um, that's just basically saying if anyone has any questions about how to do this with Google Compute Engine, it's a slightly different approach. But I'm just looping through each of the YAML files I showed you and doing a create. I don't know why I've got a lot of it off. Um, which probably not all, but, uh, <coughs> and that should hopefully. <coughs> Can I have a round of applause, please? Hey! Hey, thank you. It's fun, this is so spontaneous. Um, so, what we've actually done here is, actually, is created those things. And if I go back to this, suddenly they're appearing. And it's pulling those down, I really hope, over my 4G connection. Probably going to regret that. Um, pulling down those images. Um, it's, it's Ajax, but not quite Ajax enough. Ajax enough that they got something spinning, but not actually <laughs> reloading. Um, so, good luck. That'll take a second. As it pulls it down over the Wi Fi, which should be reasonably fast here. Okay. I'm going to leave that for a wee minute to download. Um, I'll maybe go back to So while I'm waiting for that to come up, I'll just finish off the last couple of things. I mentioned secrets. Um, that is something you need to think about. Also configuration management, I haven't included that here, but um, something like NCD or so forth can be incorporated. I've actually found that for a basic Laravel app, you don't need to have um, for a basic Laravel app, you don't really need to have separate configuration because there's a lot of the stuff can be pulled in. Um, that's fairly basic and standard, or is naturally part of the code. Um, but yes, that is something worth having in mind. Uh, backups again, something kind of need to have a plan in place. Testing, well, I kind of showed you that. That's with you using the GitLab CI approach, you've got all that, but ultimately once you get to Kubernetes, it's assuming everything's tested. And um, how you actually get Kubernetes up and going, that's part of what I've showed you I've done with the Cloud Repository and pushing and pulling. Um, ideally, and this is what should be coming into play, is that GitLab can actually fire two of Kubernetes instances. All right, cluster. Okay, so I'll just very quickly um, <laughs> Okay, <laughs> there, there is a possibility that I get my, uh, my cap, but hopefully not. That'll continue down. Some of those packages will be pretty big, don't say pretty big, big, okay. Uh, it you can get really nicely cut down containers. Um, and you can optimize it. The problem is if you want to add an extra, so for example, say I get one of the really nice optimized, you can get some down into the tens of megabytes, um, which uh, guy, Dermot Brown, or Dermot Bradley, who's around, uh, around Belfast, that's one of his kind of you know, hobbies, is, uh, is minimizing the tens. Um, problem is, of course, say you want to add on an extra package, you would step that says, App to get update, app to get installed, and suddenly you've just vastly increased, just added in all of the apt caching mm -hmm. uh, into your container. So then you have to strip it out again to get it back down. So, so yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to hope the best would be with those containers. Um, but if you do have any questions, please fire away. I'll take some of them, but the rest are going to run. Is the wheel Good idea. Just the right amount of time. <laughs> um, to apologise, the sound is loud. <laughs> okay. Did you actually hear that? 
Just a just one. Container running is one process rather than entire machine, it's one process and it is Nginx, for example. So that does make them very quick to bring up. And, it's, and I'll maybe try and kill one here and see how fast it comes back up. <coughs> um, now that it's got the images cached, way! Um, okay. So I, um, I will show you here the. Oops, it is. So I use this Kube control, as I mentioned, I can actually use this, the, the web interface doesn't give me anything I can't get here, uh, but it's kind of prettier and it's got different colors. Um, that gives me the age, uh, it does tell me, so say you notice this is one of one, I can say I need three Nginx instances, for example, and then it'll tell me when they're all up. Um, <laughs> What it really needs is another column that says how much AWS is charging you per second. <laughs> That's yet to arrive. Um, I, now, the way the load balance works here, this is actually to kind of a uh, preempt question that might come. Um, if you fire this in AWS on Google Cloud, obviously there's different infrastructure for getting to the ads, for adding a service onto the internet. Kubernetes understands how to do major cloud providers, and it is extensible. Um, however, each has its own concept of a load balancer, and it effectively you, you can get what they call a node port, which is basically a high number port to see into a given VM. But that kind of complicates things a bit because you know we send to someone go to my website call on three nine seven two one doesn't really have to say what it is. But uh, if you have even if you are wanting to scale or distribute load, the load balancer effectively provides a single point of entry. Um, <clears throat> so if I look at the services, one of them is a load balancer, and Kubernetes knows out of the box, the load balancer again, it's a very short YAML file. Uh, it knows how to do that in Minikube as well as in AWS. Oops, sorry. Um, SVC service, same thing. Okay, so that tells me uh, I've got port 443, and the way I, on Minikube, the way I get in is actually this, this node port concept that I stick on a big number at the end. <clears throat> but on, um, say, AWS, that will have a public IP that you can add. Um, Three one two three four. Um, so 
uh, because it's on a bit on a VM. Minikube knows what VM is, so Minikube's the thing that's running in that bit. Because I really have a memory of Goldfish, I'm going to copy that. That's pretty ridiculous, really, because it's only five digits string on here. And three, one, two, four, three. What's the menu doing? Copy three, four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. On second thoughts, yeah, <laughs> didn't copy enough stuff. <laughs> um, okay, that's a good thing, TM. That's also a good thing because I need to take off for it. This is a bad thing. <laughs> hey! I'd like to dedicate this to Kubernetes and that cool uh, thing about Illustrated Children's videos. <laughs> Um, okay, so there you go. That's, that's the demo. Uh, 